Hi everyone, welcome to another Hatton's Model Railways live stream session and today we're covering part two of being able to identify buffer beam details and a different pipe work, its purpose on our locomotives and on rolling stock too. So we're covering some of the more modern locomotives in this afternoon session. We're looking at diesels and electric locos from the 1950s right through to the current day. Now, if you've not seen part one, that covered steam locomotives right from their introduction over 200 years ago up to around the 1960s and covering some of the areas in preservation too. So we'll be looking at some of the different fittings that are on buffer beams, some of the locomotives that have certain parts, some of the locomotives that don't, and their purpose and point in them existing too. With the models that are becoming more and more available now, they are getting a huge amount of detail on them. Some of the details we have never be, never seen before in model form. So it's great to know what the purpose of those details are, whether they come pre-fitted or whether they are supplied in a detailing bag for your model. So looking at the front of this Class 24 diesel locomotive, we can see there's a heck of a lot more pipes to contend with here than we saw on most of the steam locomotives in part one. But at the same time, that's not a major issue at all. We can really start to identify those and sort out some of the complications there too. So let's head over to our buffer beam for our diesel locomotive and we'll start to pick out some of the different parts. So I've already got one labelled up there for you, actually. We'll come back to number two. We'll start on number one. These are the buffers of the locomotive. These are the shock absorbing units. So when coupling up to other items and other trains, they will, these will take away some of the shock rather than coupling up frame to frame of the individual locomotives. By the time these diesels came into operation in 1940s and 1950s, all of these buffers were sprung. There were very few, if any, fixed buffers that were carried by diesel locomotives out there. So you will find that these are all sprung in real life and are sprung on a lot of the models that are available too. They do come in different shapes and sizes, dependent on the locomotives carrying them and the duties they perform too. You'll often find that larger buffers are on some of the locomotives that were able to handle the tighter point work and radii's of different curves out there and then you would prevent the buffers actually running over each other and locking in position. So a lot of locomotives have the oval style buffers that we see here on the screen but then you'll see the round circular buffers, rectangular buffers and a lot of different designs too. They all serve the same purpose but they do have different shapes and sizes for specific locos specific duties and specific design. So have a look at your chosen locomotive when you are choosing the buffers. You'll generally find that 99.9% .9 of models are supplied with the correct buffers pre-fitted. If you're renumbering your locomotive, if you're changing it to a different identity, that's when we start to need to worry about different styles of buffers. Otherwise, pretty much every model these days comes with those already available so let's head over to our second point on our buffer beam and this is the ever important coupling hook itself just in the middle there just to the right of the number two that i've annotated it with for you and this is to enable the coupling itself the chain or the screw link coupling which we have here to hook onto the actual coupling itself so you can hook the coupling behind the coupling hook and then that will allow us to attach the locomotive to other vehicles in our formation including other locomotives rolling stock vehicles pretty much everything you want to connect this loco to you can connect it to there also great question there from Ono regarding whether the coupling came from the locomotive or the wagon to hook on it would generally be from the locomotive you can see just to the right of my annotated number two digit there that the coupling here this screw link coupling which is actually my point number three which we'll head over to now this is permanently attached to our locomotive so it's a more secure connection and you would find in that case that the coupling itself from the locomotive would be hooked onto the coach or 
the wagon or whichever way we are looking at it there. So then that would be attached. You'll often find that between coaches and wagons, you do have a different system called Buckeye couplings, which is different than the actual chain or chain screw link coupling system that we see on the front of the locomotives here. But generally, right up to the modern day, as we see here on this Class 70 locomotive, the screw link coupling is still in operation. This is a two link chain coupling with a big screw in the middle. You can just see the screw tightener hanging down from that coupling there. And then this allows, in, allows you to tighten up or slacken the couplings on these particular vehicles to make sure that you don't have a bumpy ride out on your tracks. So we've looked at the two styles of the couplings there now. We've looked at the two major parts. Let's head over to part four of our setup. And this is on some of the earlier diesels. You don't see them on locomotives built after around the mid 1960s, but certainly kept out there on some of the heritage diesels that are still in use today. This is our vacuum brake pipe. So a lot of the earlier diesel locomotives were designed to be compatible with the earlier vacuum brake stocks, such as wagons and Mark 1 coaches. And they did retain these fittings, even if they weren't used, they often retained the vacuum brake equipment or certainly the pipes up until their withdrawal. So we can see that pipe coming down there from the buffer beam straight downwards being hung and clipped away out of use. I don't imagine that's been used on this locomotive for many years indeed. And it's got a little bit of a, you can just about make it out in the photo there. It's not a, not a straight pipe by any means. It's almost got a bit of an elephant's trunk design to it but you'll only see these on some of the more classic diesel locomotives. Heading over to point five, we find our more common pipes for braking on diesels. These are the air pipes. So this is now an air braking system, which was brought in across Britain's railways throughout the 1950s and 1960s. But a lot of companies had trialed it earlier with steam locomotives and on some companies being fitted with air brakes too. To differentiate these, there's a couple of different colours that you can choose from. There's actually three main colours. So you'll see on those pipes hanging down and where they clip into the buffer beam, they have different colour heads where they join together with the air brake pipes on the trains themselves. These pipes, the yellow pipe is the reservoir pipe for the air. The main brake pipe is actually the red pipe there. So that is the full controlling pipe. And that then allows a full continuous brake through the train controlled by the locomotive. When the locomotive applies its air brake, if it's set up on this certain mode, the brakes on the train will apply too. So you'll get a better brake force and your train will be able to stop a lot easier and a lot quicker if needs be. So those pipes are on the coaches and wagons that are out there too. And a locomotive or wagon can have a what's called a through pipe. And that is a white headed pipe. So it will have no brakes fitted itself, but the air pipe will continue through the train. So any vehicles behind that will have those fitted. So again, if you're looking at adding the air pipes to your locomotives, a lot of them do come pre-fitted now, but they are an essential part of any diesel locomotive from the 1960s right through to the current day. This air pipe mechanism is still in operation across the UK's railway system and beyond. So have a look at the different colours, make sure you've got the right ones for your particular locomotive and refer to the locomotive's manual or photos online such as this for specific details. Moving on to number six, we have what's called our multiple working equipment or multiple working jumpers as they are known. These are electrical connections which again are hooked from locomotive to locomotive and these then allow multiple control from one driving cab. The locomotives have got to be compatible, but then it allows for less crew operating the loco. So you could have two class 37s or two class 66s, both being driven by the same driver. That's controlled electrically and electric signals are passed through the pipes on the locomotives there. And you can just see where they join into and leave the locomotives on each side. So there's two sets of pipes that would be hooked up. You'll only see these hooked up if the locomotives are being used in a pair or in some very rare cases, a trio, these would be used in. 
And as a little side note, you can just see above those, you can see the little blue stars on the locomotive. This indicates the type of multiple working that was used on this engine because not all of them were compatible. And this symbol shows that this uses the blue star multiple working system. So you could only hook this up and use it in multiple with another Blue Star locomotive. There's quite a few of those different codes. And if it's something you'd like to learn a little bit more about, let me know in the comments or in the stream as we can consider that for a future video. So if you're using a loco in multiple, those are the cables you want to hook up there too. Headed over to number seven, we have some more orange cables on the front of our locomotive. As with the multiple working equipment, they're not found on absolutely every single British diesel design, but they are quite commonplace out there and similar in their type. So again, have a bit of a look at these and see if they are appropriate for your locomotive. We covered in the steam video the steam heat pipes that were prominent on a lot of steam locomotives. And whilst a, a small number of diesels did carry these in the 1960s and 1970s, these quickly faded away and were replaced or introduced as the electric train heat system, as we see here. So again, this is a single cable that comes down from the front of the locomotive and supplies electricity to the coaches behind. This can heat the electric heaters inside the more modern coaches, or it can supply lighting power or what's called shore supply too, which is great for anything else that is electrically powered in your vehicle. So these will be hooked up to certain passenger vehicles with the pipes again stretching from the locomotive's front onto the corresponding connection on the carriage or the second locomotive behind there. So these again are quite prominent on locomotives that are expected to work passenger duties, including the class 37 we just saw on the screen, the class 50 I have in front of me here, and more modern locomotives such as the class 68 do have these electric train connections fitted to them too. So that is number seven for you there, just showing the start and end. And you can just about follow that pipe from one end to the other. So we've covered the majority of our controls on the front of our locomotive now, but we've missed one really big point here. It's big, it's yellow, it's at the bottom of the locomotive. It is point eight of today's stream. These are snow plows. These are fitted periodically to a lot of locomotives, mainly in the winter months, to clear snow off the railhead. So you've got two snow plows left and right there, which are directly above the rails. So they will brush away any snow from the rails. The centre snow plow there, acting as a rest for our coupling mechanism, is fantastic at deflecting snow from the centre of the rails too. So any of the equipment there, such as the signalling equipment, or other line side equipment. And of course, point mechanisms too there. That center piece of the snow plow acts fantastically in deflecting any snow away from those all important mechanisms. Again, not seen on absolutely every diesel locomotive out there, but if you see those yellow snow plows, all they were painted black when they were first installed in the 1960s. They're an all important part of modeling a locomotive that's working out there in the winter months, especially in the highlands of Scotland or other parts of the UK where it can get a little bit chilly. So let's have a look at some different locomotives now and we'll start to be able to identify some of the pipes that we have here. We've got our Class 40 diesel locomotive from the 1960s, seen here in a depot. And that gives us a great opportunity to look at some of the pipes on this locomotive. From left to right, we can see some of the multiple working equipment, the vacuum brake pipe, the coupling hook and coupling itself, the screw link coupling on there. We can just about see some of the air brake pipes on this locomotive too. And to the right of the right hand side buffer, we can see some of that multiple working equipment again with those telltale blue stars just above the buffers on this locomotive. So this will be fully compatible with our class 37 diesel that we saw previously. 
looking at those different systems there and i can see already we've had a few people asking about stream for that we will cover it in more depth in the future it really does depend on certain locomotives running together i don't believe there was any electric and diesel locomotives that had the same multiple working system but that is something i'll do some research on and keep an eye on our channel as we will be looking at doing a stream on that in the future so let's have a look at a couple more examples we'll stick with the classic diesels for now head over to our class 33 locomotive this has got a few different fittings on both the buffer beam and the front of the loco, so we can highlight some of those here. Right in the middle of the two buffers, you can see what's known as a Buckeye coupling. These are commonly found on coaches, but this locomotive was designed to work with certain types of coaches over an extended period of time. So this was fitted with the same coupling style as the coaches there with that Buckeye coupling being fitted. You'll also just be able to make out immediately above that is what's known as a rubbing plate. So this would then rub against the corridor connection of the coaches to act as a secondary buffer and also to prevent any damage there or slackening of the couplings. Whilst they're not technically on the buffer beam, they're certainly worth mention. Three more fittings on the front of our loco there. We have a bell and a light for working on the Weymouth Harbour Tramway, a very rare installation, but nonetheless really exciting to see here. And then on the left and right of those, our multiple working jumpers, which have previously been located on the buffer beam, were installed on the cab front of these particular designs that you see here. So it just goes to show, do some research into the particular locomotive that you are looking at and taking a closer look at because you will find that a lot of the same items are still there. They just might not be fitted where you expect them. Having a look at some more modern locomotives, we have an EWS Class 66 in front of us here. With this being a freight locomotive, we have no train heating. The vacuum brake system is long since obsolete, so we don't have that there. But we have our all-important oval buffers. We have our red and yellow air pipes there too. And we have a Buckeye coupling, which has conveniently been located out of the way. It's on a swing there, so it can swing to the side. This, again, is capable of working with Buckeye-fitted wagons, or it does have a conventional screw link coupling too. Our Class 70, there's really not much to talk about here. We've got our square buffers. We have our air pipes, again, just hiding behind the right-hand side buffer. And once again, our screw link coupling. Underneath this is what's known as an air dam. So it's slightly different than a snowplow. This actually protects some of the equipment behind it and does act as an obstacle deflector, but also deflects the air away from this area. So some of the really high-tuned scientific equipment that hide behind, hides behind that will not be damaged by the air coming through or indeed any obstacles and they do still work pretty decent for deflecting some of the snow there too we did promise you some electrics and i'll show you again just one of the early class 81 locomotives that you can see here on the screen very similar set of kit to what we've seen previously so we have our vacuum brake on the left of this locomotive to the left of the coupling We've got our coupling hook and the screw link coupling. We have our air brake pipes. And just to the right of the right-hand side buffer, we have our electric train heating supply. So you can see here that there's quite a lot of similar equipment shared between this lo these locomotives of both past and present designs. We've got here the EM2 Woodhead electrics from the early 1950s, right through to the Class 66s and the even more modern Class 70 that we saw a couple of moments ago. You'll see that there's a lot in common with the different styles of fittings, but it really can depend on the purpose of the locomotive as to what parts are there, and what parts aren't and when it was constructed too with the obsolete vacuum brake and steam heat systems not being a part of locomotives such as the class 66. as ever i'd always recommend having a really good read through your locomotives manual when you pick up your new model to make sure all the detail parts are there whether they're pre-fitted as on our Helgen Class 50 here, or they need a little bit of installation, and you can check our video out on our channel on how to fit details to your locomotives. 
But if you'd like to learn a little bit more, if you're still not quite sure what that specific part is that you have hanging around waiting to be fitted to your certain loco, do get in touch. Either leave a comment on our video or get in touch with our customer experience team who will be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Otherwise, I hope you've enjoyed this little guide. I hope you've learned a little bit more of something about the different pipes that we see on the front of our locomotives. Don't forget to check out part one too, as you'll see more information on the pipe work on steam locomotives. Plus now you've got both parts available, you'll be able to see some of the common fittings that are carried all the way through the different locomotives that we have in our range. So I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you'd like to learn a little bit more, don't hesitate to subscribe to our YouTube channel and our Facebook page for more great videos like this. Otherwise, thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time. Take care.